Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 14 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. Myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. In earlier lectures, we have discussed about different seismic waves which are generated during the process of earthquake occurrence as well as interaction of the waves with the surficial layer of the earth. In today's lecture, we will be discussing in detail about one specific wave that is P wave also known as primary wave or longitudinal wave or compressional wave. We will be discussing more about the nature of the wave, some portion we have already discussed in earlier classes. So, we will be also discussing in detail about the governing equation which discusses about the propagation of P wave through a particular medium. This will be required in order to determine how much time a wave which is primary wave in nature will take between the epicenter and your recording station in order to reach and getting detected at the recording station. Before going to the derivation for one dimensional equation of motion for P wave, we will brush up some of the basics of primary wave which we have discussed in earlier lecture. As we know earthquakes generally do not cause directly any kind of damage to the infrastructure and so on with respect to the fatalities. So, most of the time it is the response which an infrastructure which can be a building, it can be a slope, it can be a dam, it can be a bridge, how these infrastructures are going to respond to the loading which is induced by earthquake. That means, whenever there is an earthquake, different kinds of wave will generate from the epicenter and depending upon the propagation medium, some wave will get attenuated, some may get amplified. So, this modified content of frequency content of wave once it reaches to the side where actually structure is available, how the structure is going to respond to these external loading condition will define whether the structure will remain intact, whether the structure will undergo cracks or partial damage or complete collapse. Depending upon the response of the structure to these seismic loading condition will also govern whether there will be any kind of fatalities to the intended user of that particular structure or not. So, finally, it is not the seismic wave which are directly responsible for damage, it is basically the response of your infrastructure which is going to govern how a particular seismic wave and a building, a soil, a dam is going to respond. So, that is going to collectively define whether it will be damaged or there will be fatalities. Now, one thing we have discussed earlier like depending upon the convection current different plates will be moving in different direction. In this process there will be development of stresses within the plate itself. Subsequently, depending upon the type of motion which is dominating at a particular fault which is whether it can be strike slip faulting, it is a dip slip faulting, oblique faulting, similarly normal faulting, reverse faulting. So, each of these faulting when these kinds of movements are happening along the fault, there will be storage of strain energy. When the strain energy storage exceeds or the building up of stresses exceeds the in situ strength of the rock medium which is available at your fault plane, definitely the medium will undergo failure including rupture. As a result, seismic wave will come into picture. So, depending upon the type of wave, the material through which the waves are passing will respond in different different ways. That means, when we talk about primary waves, primarily we will be discussing primary wave in today's lecture. So, let us discuss about primary wave and then we will discuss about the behavior of propagation medium or the particles when the primary wave is propagating through a particular medium. What we are trying to understand here is when at the source primary wave was generated, when this wave is propagating through a particular medium, what is happening within the medium which is governing the propagation of primary wave through that particular medium and subsequently depending upon the stiffness the medium is offering, there will be change in the characteristics of the wave. When I say uh, change in the characteristics that means primarily I am focusing on the frequency content of the motion and its corresponding amplitude. So, let us discuss about primary wave. 
this is kind of revision of the previous uh, lecture in which we have discussed about seismic waves and their attenuation because we will be discussing after some gap of lectures again about the seismic waves. So, here I am giving an overview about primary wave as the name suggests these are the waves which reach first at a recording station that means, if there is a recording station and some earthquake has happened at some epicenter. So, when the waves started from the epicenter or from the focus primarily when these are starting and started propagating in all the direction primary wave will be the first one which will be reaching or getting detected at the recording station. Since these waves result in compression and rarefaction in the medium through which these are propagating these waves are also called as compressional waves. Thirdly, because the motion of the particle through the medium which the wave is propagating that motion is also happening in longitudinal direction. To understand more specifically about the nature of particle motion here is an animation given at the bottom. So, you can see over here depending upon the direction. So, if the wave propagation is happening in this particular direction. So, direction of wave propagation is in the direction of this particular arrow and subsequently it is propagating through a medium. So, I have considered any particular element and then you can pick up any particular element or one particular small part of this particular elementary rod. You can see whenever the wave is under passing through this particular element initially the material will undergo compression then the material will undergo rarefaction. Finally, once the wave propagation is over through that particular element the material come back to its original position that means there will not be any volume change in the material. So, wave has propagated but because of the nature that is compression and rarefaction which the wave causes to the propagation medium initially there will be compression followed by rarefaction and then the material come back to its original position and subsequently the wave will pass or there will be subsequent movement of particle adjacent to the initial particle and that is how the wave will propagate to larger distances. So, the propagation of primary wave is primarily identical to sound wave passing through a liquid. So, there will be compression and rarefaction. These will transmit the seismic energy which they actually originated from the focus of the earthquake causing compression and rarefaction in the material through which it moves. That can be also understood by means of back and forth motion in the material through which the waves pass. As I mentioned these are the first wave which is primarily used or primarily generated from the source and getting detected at the recording station. So, these are the fastest in terms of the propagation velocity 5 to 8 kilometer per second in the earth's crust more than 8 kilometer per second in the mantle 1.5 kilometer per second in water and 0.3 kilometer per second in air. So, this is roughly the propagation velocity of each of these waves. Generally, if you see the amplitude of the waves, it is relatively less in comparison to other waves that means, shear waves and surface wave. The amplitude of the wave will be lesser, but the propagation velocity of these waves will be much faster than other kinds of waves. Now, again you can see if this is the direction in which the wave is propagating and this is the same direction in which the material is undergoing compression and rarefaction. So, the direction in which the particle is undergoing motion and the direction in which the wave is propagating are same. In the end once the wave passes through a particular medium there will not be any volume change. So, this property of how the material is interacting with the propagation of the wave is very important that is there is no deformation or volume change in the material through which the wave passes. One important characteristic is these can travel through solid as well as liquid as far as the material is offering resistance to the propagation of these kinds of waves the material the, the wave can propagate through that particular medium. So, while discussing about so, so this is to give you an idea about what is primary wave. Now, based on our understanding so far about primary wave we have understood that whenever there is an earthquake these waves will be the fastest to reach a recording station. 
this is one primary reason why the primary waves arrival time has been used in many countries across the globe while developing earthquake early warning systems. Considering the nature of particle oscillation generated by the propagation of these waves, these are not causing actually lot of damages primarily, but still these can be used in order to detect because once primary wave reaches to the site, that means somewhere there will be a secondary wave also which will be also reaching to the particular site which will actually induce shearing in the medium leading to different kinds of failures. So, in order to make sure that some secondary wave is also on the way and about to reach the recording station or your site or a building, you can utilize the characteristics and the arrival time of primary wave and depending upon your threshold value which many of the early warning systems use a person can decide whether it is exceeding a threshold value such that an alarm need to be issued or still it is within the threshold value there is no need of any issue of any alarm for the user or for the intended user in the region. So, if you, you if you release an alarm definitely people will come to know an earthquake related shear wave is going to hit and then particularly you can move to safer location and your high speed uh, moving train can be put to complete halt such that the damage can be minimized to significant level. So, continuing with the topic we will be discussing in uh, further about the derivation of one dimensional equation of motion for primary wave. That means, we are interested to develop what is the governing equation which is going to describe the motion or propagation of primary wave through a particular medium. So, as we discussed in previous slide also, in order to understand and drive the equation, we will be taking one elementary step over here. I have taken an elementary strip of length L and there are two cross sections over here. Again within this particular elementary strip, so I can write here considering again over here I can mention A as cross section, cross sectional area of the rod So, this is a cross sectional area of a rod considering a rod of length capital L and having cross section of or cross sectional area of A subjected to subjected to passage of P wave. That means P wave is passing through this particular elementary rod, you can mark also the direction of propagation as direction of P wave propagation Now, in order to further understand, we will take consider an element elementary length of d x. So, we had an element of length l within that particular element I am considering a small length which is d x on which we will try to understand what is the change in the medium characteristics going to happen 
when the wave is passing through this particular element. So, let us consider these are two cross sections cross section 1 1 and then cross section 2 2. So, two sections actually have taken here and I will be interested to know if this is the direction of wave propagation that is the wave is propagating from section 1 1 and enters section d x length and then leaves through section 2 2. So, considering an element length of d x s p wave passes through elementary length of d x there will be development of there will be development of axial stresses along sections 1 1 and 2 2. That means, when we have reached to section 1 1 the material is offering resistance and between 1 1 and 2 2 considering the length is d x and the material is also having some stiffness. So, there will be change in the stress between section 1 1 and 2 2. Considering the nature of primary wave which is causing compression and rarefaction that is why we will be having axial stresses develop at section 1 1 and as well as, as section 2 2. So, let now one thing which we should uh, observe here is when primary wave which is having a nature of compression and rarefaction when the incident wave is at 1 1 and when the same wave continues to 2 2 there will be some change in the stresses between 1 1 and 2 2 because of length d x as a result if I am considering let delta x uh, sigma x is the axial stress develop at section 1 1 let sigma x be the axial stress at section 1 1 hence after elementary length of elementary length of d x axial stress at section 2 2 will be there will be change in the stress values between section 1 1 and 2 2 because it is a material which is continuously offering resistance to propagation. So, this will be sigma x plus dou over dou x elementary length dou over dou x sigma x d x. So, this is along the length d x if there is change in stresses at the rate of dou by dou x sigma x then this is at section 2 2. So, here it is sigma x plus dou over dou x sigma x d x and at section 1 1 it is sigma x. Now, for equilibrium one uh, thing which we have to mention here or assumption which has to be highlighted here is assume that the stresses are these axial stresses are uniformly distributed. uniformly distributed across the cross section. That means, across the cross section A either you consider 1 or section 2 the stresses are uniformly distributed throughout the section. So, there is no variation across the section in terms of stresses. So, with this you can go ahead with you have the value of stresses 
between two sections that is section 1 1 and section 2 2 following Newton's second law of motion. We know that force is equals to mass times acceleration. Now, the total force, how much is the total force acting on this elementary, acting on elementary length or elementary rod, you can say dx will be how much will be this thing that we can determine based on taking the difference between the two because at section 1 1 you are having some value of axial stresses which is assumed to be uniform throughout. Similarly, at section 2 2 whatever is the state of stress that is uniform throughout the section. So, using these two that is a cross section uniform distribution and the value of stresses one can determine how much will be the value of stress at section 2 2 because it is propagating from 1 1 to 2 2. So, you will determine. So, that will be the value sigma x plus dou over dou x sigma x d x this is the value of stress times a. So, this is the value of axial stress multiplied by the cross sectional area. So, this axial force at section 2 2 minus how much is the axial stress at section 1 1 we can also write it here at 2 2 sigma x times a. So, this is at section 1 1, this is at section 2 2, this is the total force. How we, what we will get here is dou over dou x sigma x d x and a. So, this is the total or net force which is applicable between section 1 1 and 2 2, which is responsible for which, which is actually resultant of propagation of primary wave through a particular medium. This will be equals to m times a. Let the earlier equation be numbered as 1, this equation be numbered as 2. So, here we can write as right hand side, right hand side of equation 2 that is that is m times a can be written as can be written as now here we have to make an assumption that rho is the mass density of the medium of the rod medium or rod material that means, the rod which we have shown in the previous slide that particular rod is having a mass density of rho. If that is the case, so we can write m times a that is m is the mass, mass means mass density multiplied by the volume. So, volume is a is the cross sectional area and then d x is the length of that particular rod. So, product of these three is going to give you the mass times acceleration. So, when these waves were propagating, the primary wave is propagating from 1 1 to 2 2, it is causing oscillation or change in the position of the particle with respect to initial position along the direction of wave propagation. So, consider this particular change in the position of the particle represented by u. So, you can call it as dou square u over dou t square you can say as u as particle motion or change in the position of the particle because of the propagation of the wave or particle displacement. So, we now we have also understood there is a particle which is undergoing motion and this particle is undergoing motion because the primary wave has a characteristic that whenever it propagates through a particular medium, it will cause oscillation in the particle in the direction of propagation, which though it will result in compression and air friction, but finally, the material will come back to its original position. So, this is going to give you 
this is basically the value of acceleration dou square u over dou t square. Thus, combining or putting this particular value, putting the value of m a in equation 2 will give dou by dou x d x sigma x d x times a equals to rho a d x dou square u over dou t square. Now, from here we can understand this is going to give you the value as dou by dou x d x equals rho dou a square u over dou t square. So, this is the same thing which has come over here. So, this particular equation I am giving as number 3, this particular equation I am giving as number 4. So, here it is basically d x and a were there on both the sides, rest of the things will remain over here. Just a correction, this will be sigma x. So, dou by dou x sigma x equals to rho times dou a square u over dou t square. Sigma x is the axial stress at section 1, u is particle displacement with, res with respect to propagation of primary wave through a particular medium. Now, let us further see to this particular equation. We know that we know that sigma x, we can write sigma x equals to m times epsilon. Just I will mention over here is where m is constrained modulus which will ensure ensure no volume change due to propagation of propagation of P wave through the medium. So, constraint modulus we have used often we correlate stress and strain by means of Young's modulus, shear modulus here we are using constraint modulus because we discussed also when the wave propagates there will be some compression rarefaction, but once the wave further propagates the material will come back to its original volume. So, in order to ensure that there will not be any change in the volume we will be using here compression modulus constraint modulus. Further, epsilon value that will be equals to dou u over dou x that means, change in the position of the particle over the distance d x. Remember, u is also in the same direction as we are measuring d x. Therefore, so dou over in equation 4 we were having dou by uh, dou x sigma x. So, from here what we can get is m is will be outside dou over dou x of dou u over dou x that is going to give you dou over this sigma x equals to m dou a square u over dou x square. So, you have now this particular equation that is equation number 5 I can name this dou by dou x sigma x which was there in previous equation. What was equation number 4? Dou by dou x sigma x equals to rho times dou a square u over dou t square. Now, the left hand side of this particular equation has been determined in terms of u value because right hand side is also in terms of u value. So, we can write over here that is rho times dou a square u over 
dou t square equals m times dou a square u over dou x square. Rearranging the terms or I can write it over here also this is equation number 6. Rearranging the terms of equation 6, it can be written as, it can be again written as So, equation 6 again we can write it as dou a square u over dou t square equals m over rho dou a square u over dou x square. Consider m over rho equals to v p square where v p is propagation velocity of primary wave, propagation velocity of P wave through medium, through a medium having rho as mass density. and m as constraint modulus. So, any medium which is having mass density of rho and m as constraint modulus, we can determine the value of v p that is. So, here we can also write it as that means, v p equals to square root of m over rho putting this value of v p, you can just put it in bracket. So, we can get dou square u over dou t square equals v p square dou square u over dou x square. Now, here you can see on one side the particle displacement with respect to space and the particle motion with respect to time is correlated with the primary wave velocity. This particular equation that is equation 7, equation 7 is known as one dimensional wave equation for primary wave or P wave that is above equation is governing how the particle motion with respect to space and time will happen for a medium having V P as primary wave velocity. Now, when we can write as V P I have already mentioned that V P is a function of constant modulus of the medium and mass density of the medium. Again, m is correlated with Young's modulus and Young's modulus E, which is primarily used and Poisson's ratio nu as. So, if you know these two values because uh, that is how you can correlate actually Young's modulus and constant modulus. So, m will be equals to 1 over nu over 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu times E or Young's modulus. So, constant modulus and Young's modulus are correlated for a particular medium having Poisson's ratio of nu, Young's modulus denoted by E, constant modulus denoted by m. So, again using these three parameters, 
one can correlate how much will be the value of constraint modulus if Young's modulus is given or how much will be the value of Young's modulus if constraint modulus is given or when these two values are given what will the Poisson's ratio of the medium. Now, one more uh, information one can ask like, because when wave is propagating it is not the particle velocity it is wave propagation velocity. Though the direction of wave propagation and particle motion is in same direction, but still the particle velocity as well as wave velocities are two different properties. So, we can write here please note note here that V p that is is p wave propagation velocity. velocity and is not the particle velocity or the velocity with which the particles are undergoing to and fro motion is not particle movement or particle displacement corresponding velocity. corresponding velocity. So, in order to determine it u we discussed as u was particle displacement when the primary wave is passing through the medium and dou u over dou t is the particle velocity or the velocity with which the particles are moving. So, dou u by dou t one can write as dou u by dou x times dou x over dou t. Dou u by dou x is we know that it is the value of epsilon that is normal strain and then dou x by dou t is the value of v p for our primary wave velocity. This particular value of epsilon can be correlated with respect to constant modulus as sigma x over m which can further be correlated as rho times v p square and v p. So, this can be written as sigma x over rho times v p. This is the value of dou u over dou t or which I can write as u dot. That means, the particle velocity or the velocity with which the particle are undergoing movement to and fro motion that is directly proportional to the axial stress and so u dot is directly proportional proportional to sigma x and the constant of proportionality proportionality that is rho times v p is called as not directly proportional it is proportional to sigma x is proportional to sigma x and then rho times v p is called as specific impedance of the material. of the medium which can be determined as once you know the mass density and wave propagation velocity we can determine the value of rho times v p which is the specific impedance of that particular medium once this value is known to you depending upon the axial stress generated at a particular section one can determine how much is the 
particle oscillation velocity across that particular section that is section 1 1 or section 1 2. So, this de derivation which we have discussed over here that is helping us to understand when the primary wave is incident on a particular medium, how the propagation velocity will be governed by means of constant modulus, by means of mass density of the medium and how the change in particle position with respect to space and time are also governed by means of one dimensional equation of motion, which is given in the previous slides. So, now so far we have understood how the governing equation of motion can be determined for primary wave. Secondly, the, the square root of the ratio of constant modulus over mass density of the medium will give you how much is the primary wave velocity. One thing is clear over here as far as the medium is offering resistance in terms of constant modulus the primary wave will be able to propagate to that particular medium. Secondly, once we know the primary wave velocity of a particular medium, we can also determine how much will be the particle motion through that particular medium. If the medium as far as the medium is offering stiffness the, prop, the uh, in terms of constraint modulus, primary wave will be able to propagate to that particular medium. So, unlike shear waves which generally do not pass through or generally do not travel through liquids, primary wave can travel through liquids as far as it is propagating through a medium and medium is, over, is able to offer stiffness in terms of constant modulus which is also available for liquids, primary wave will be able to propagate to that particular medium. So, we can number this particular equation as equation number 8. Now, let us discuss one numerical problem. Suppose, in general you have been given what is the mass density of a particular medium, how much is the constraint modulus of a particular medium, you can determine how much is the primary wave velocity. Depending upon the propagation medium, one can determine primary wave velocity. As we discussed in the beginning of this particular lecture, whether the primary wave is propagating through air, whether it is passing through water, whether it is propagating through rock, it is propagating through rubber, it is propagating to different mediums, the primary velocity keeps on changing. We will be using the information on primary wave velocity more frequently when we are trying to locate the epicenter of an earthquake. So, using the record which is being detected or which has been available at a recording station, we will try to find out how much is the arrival time of primary wave velocity, what, what is the arrival time of primary wave at your recording stations and once that arrival time is known to us using that information we can find out taking that primary wave velocity into account and the time of arrival, we can find out what is the radial distance within which the epicenter of your earthquake is located. When this exercise is repeated for more than 3 number of recording station, we will get more closer idea about potential location in which the epicenter of an earthquake is located. So, in today's lecture, we will also try to solve a numerical where we can determine how much is the primary wave velocity through different mediums. So, we will ge also get an understanding about depending upon the medium properties that is constant modulus which is given over here. So, here three mediums are given that is steel, water and rubber. The specific gravities are also given rather than mass density, we have been given the specific gravity of that particular medium and we have been given the constant modulus value. We, we could have also been given the Young's modulus as well as the Poisson's ratio. So, again we, one can determine how much is the constraint modulus using the equation which was given in du during the derivation. Now, it is asked to determine how much is the primary wave velocity. So, using this we know 
the primary wave velocity is the ratio of constraint modulus over mass density of the medium. So, for case 1 that is for the case of steel the constraint modulus value is given as 2.78 into 10 raise to the power 11 Newton per millimeter square. Mass density is given as mass density actually is not given it is given as specific gravity is given. So, 7.82 is the specific gravity of the medium multiply by 1000 gram per meter cube that is going to give you how much will be the value of. So, 78200 kg per meter cube one has to be very careful while dealing with the units because one is given in Newton per meter square other one is given in kg per meter cube. So, using these two values one can determine the value of V p equals 2.78 into 10 raise to the power 11 over 78200. So, this is going to give you the mass density and constraint modulus based on the ratio you one can determine. So, you will get the value equals to 5962 meter per second that is the velocity with which primary wave will pass through the medium of steel having specific gravity of 7.82 and constant modulus equals to 2.78 into 10 raise to the power 11 Pascal. Go with the second part that is for water having mass density of 1000 kg per meter cube and constant modulus equals to 2.3 into 10 raise to the power 9 Pascals. One can determine the V p value equals to square root of 2.3 into 10 raise to the power 9 over 1000, which is going to give you the primary wave velocity of 1516 meter per second which is equals to 1.5 kilometer per second. So, this is the velocity with which primary wave will propagate through a particular medium. C that is given for rubber the value of mass density is given as 1.28 is the specific gravity given multiply by 1000. So, 1280 kg per meter cube is the mass density of the medium and constant modulus is given as 1.15 into 10 raise to the power 12 Pascals. Hence, the value of V p one can determine as 1.15 into 10 raise to the power 12 over 1280 which will result in 2993.9 meter per second or 29.9 approximately 29.9 kilometer per second as the propagation velocity of primary wave through the rubber medium. So, overall in this particular lecture that is lecture 14, we try an understanding how a primary wave passes through the medium. During the passage of primary wave, there will be change in the axial stresses because the particle is undergoing to and fro motion in the direction of wave propagation. Taking those variation in axial stresses, cross sectional details, stiffness of the medium one can determine how much is the change in the particle motion with respect to space as well as time which is directly a function of primary wave velocity. Further how primary velocity is correlated with respect to Young's modulus we have also discussed. Then if primary velocity is known to you how one can determine the particle oscillation.
or the particle motion or the displacement value. Using this, we tried solving one numerical problem where the mass density of the medium and constant modulus are given or the specific gravity of the medium is given and constant modulus are given. Converting each of these parameters into specific units, one can determine the value of primary wave velocity as well as the primary wave velocity of all the mediums. So, thank you uh, everyone. We will continue with respect to the derivation for one dimensional wave equation for shear wave in lecture 15. Thank you. Thank you.